Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today's program is dedicated to one of the most talented and beloved actresses in show business history, Patty Duke. She rose to international superstardom as a child for her Oscar winning portrayal of Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker. She went on to win our hearts on TV in The Patty Duke Show and then she starred in dozens of feature films and television movies, winning two Golden Globes, a People's Choice Award, 11 Emmy nominations, and three Emmy wins. And she was president of the Screen Actors Guild for three years. Prior to her death in 2016, at the age of 69, she had begun writing her third book, a memoir about working with some of the greatest stars in cinematic history, including Helen Hayes, Olivier, Fred Astaire, Anne Bancroft, Judy Garland, and many more. After she passed away, her co-author and dear friend William Jankowski completed the book entitled In the Presence of Greatness, My 60-Year Journey as an Actress. I'm pleased to welcome William Jankowski to our show. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Harvey. It's my pleasure and my honor. Thank you. Bill, although we all know her as Patty Duke, her real name was Anna Marie Duke, and she preferred to be called Anna, and that's how you refer to her, correct? Yeah, so as I was explaining to Harvey right before we recorded, I might go back and forth, so just bear with me. I might say Anna or Patty. I always refer to her as Anna. You were friends with her for 18 years. How did you meet her, and how did the friendship develop? Well, I had been a fan since I was eight and saw reruns of the Patty Duke show when they were playing on Nick at Night. And then two years later, when Call Me Anna, the television movie adaptation of her autobiography of the same name, uh, when that aired on television, something I just always explain, I don't know how better to explain, just like clicked in me. And I just all of a sudden became fascinated with her. I recorded it, watched it a million times as a kid, you know, as a fifth grader, I was weird. And uh, you know, I just had to know everything and anything about her. I'd scour the TV guide and all that for stuff with her. And eight years later, I wrote her a fan letter and uh, sent it. And a few days later, her and her husband emailed me and said it was the nicest uh, fan letter they'd ever received, uh, which was quite an honor for a 17 year old. And then uh, we started an online friendship. And then uh, later that year, after I turned 18, uh, they invited me to go up to Montreal where they were shooting the Patty Duke Show reunion movie at the time. So that was really cool because I got to see all of the cast members from the Patty Duke show from 30 some years earlier, I recreate their roles and got to meet them and spend time with the majority of them. And it was amazing beyond words. I can't tell you how exciting that was. Better than my dreams had ever been about that moment. I understand it was your idea that Patty should write this book with you. How did you convince her to do it? Well, by that point she had known me. This was in late 2013, so 15 years after we met. My partner, Vinny, and I, we were at her home. It was actually the day after her birthday, and uh, she was doing a, a play there, a benefit in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where she lived. And we had just finished decorating the Christmas tree and all that stuff, and I'd been wanting to ask her forever, but hadn't had the courage to ask her. So I got her alone in her kitchen, and I just said, Anna, like, with all the stories you've told me through the years, I think this needs to be a book. Because I said, one day when you're gone, you know, people will still need to remember because people are starting to forget some of the people that were so famous, like uh, roles are off the top of my head, Kim Stanley. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know who Kim Stanley is and maybe reading your book that might bring a greater appreciation to somebody like Broadway legend, Kim Stanley, who she worked with multiple times. And she really liked the idea. She was pretty modest. So more than telling her own story, it was telling her experience with these other people to honor them. So that attracted her. Patty had already written two books. Her first book, entitled Call Me Anna, is a harrowing account of the devastating abuse she suffered as a child at the hands of her managers, Mr. and Mrs. Ross. Did she talk to you much about the Rosses? It would come up every once in a while. Not too much. I mean, I will probably learn more of, about them in the book than anything from her own mouth to me personally. But once in a while, it usually would come in the sense that different rules that they had that she wouldn't be allowed to do, different things that she wouldn't be allowed to do. This is a story I've never told, but once we were in the presence of other people and the person passed some gas, and the first thing she said was, oh, I would have never been able to do that with the Rosses even, you know, like, like that's how strict they were with her. 
they were just, you know, very controlling of her in her uh, younger years and teenage years. But she also realized on the other end of the spectrum that without them and her, their coaching and guidance, she probably never would have been Patty Duke, you know, the, the, the celebrity. So she, I think, had mixed feelings toward them. She resented them in one way and appreciated them and what they did for her in another way. Her first book also takes us through those very difficult years of mental illness until she was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 1982. Do you think it was hard for her to disclose to the public that she had a mental illness given the stigma, especially back then? No. She felt that she was put on this earth for a reason. And at first I think she thought it was her acting. And then she later said her acting was a means to the act that made her famous and by the time she's diagnosed as bipolar and ready to share that information with the public that at her acting gave her the celebrity status to be able to share that with people to give her that platform i think you know at the time it was probably difficult maybe for her kids they were teenagers at the time and you know airing the dirty laundry of the family that kind of thing but no she never i don't think even second guessed anything about that she just she was very adamant she at first she said she felt like if I could help one person by telling my story, then it would all be worth it. And then she says, then I got greedy and I wanted, you know, thousands, millions. You know, she just wanted, she didn't want to stop at one person. Patty's second book is entitled A Brilliant Madness, and it's all about living with bipolar illness. It's beautifully written and so educational. She was such a strong advocate for mental health, wasn't she? Oh, yeah. I mean, as far as we know, if not the first, she was at least one of the first celebrities to come out about their own mental illness. She often gets credit, and I recently read uh, Jean Tierney's book. She came out as manic depressive, which is bipolar. It's the same thing. Bipolar is a more PC term that we use now for manic depression. But she came out in 79, a few years before Anna did, about it. But I don't think she spoke as openly, or she wrote about it in her book, but she didn't do speeches and go around the country and on talk shows, as far as I know about it like uh, Patty Duke did. People would come up to her and cry. it wasn't about her celebrity. It wasn't, oh my God, it's Patty Duke. It was about telling their story and their struggles of their own mental illness or maybe the mental illness of a, of a loved one. And she would cry with them. She would hug them. She would give, she would always say, I'm not a doctor, but here is my expert advice since I lived through this. And she'd often give her phone number to people. I mean, she was very open about that with, with perfect strangers. When I was reading In the Presence of Greatness, it felt very much like Patty was sitting there talking to me, telling me what it was like behind the scenes on her movie sets and all about the iconic stars who helped shape her life and career. Can you tell us about the process of writing that book with her? Sure. And uh, thank you for being that astute with that. In the planning process, we wanted it to be like an informal talk, like sitting around, like what I had had. For all those years where we were just sitting around either dinner or around the couch or whatever setting and uh you know just having an informal talk about these these people so I, as i said earlier i approached her and she thought it was a very good idea especially to honor the people we'd be talking about in the book so then i flew out to her home in idaho i live in pennsylvania about i don't know nine months later or whatever it was and i had a recording app on my ipad and i brought my laptop with me I would show her, let's say, for example, we were going to be doing a, a, a chapter on the Kennedys. And I should note that every chapter almost is a different person. Specifically, they're almost like essays, I guess. So some of them are about film or TV titles that she was involved with. But the majority of them are probably about people that she knew and or worked with. So for Rose Kennedy, she had interviewed her on the Mike Douglas show back in 1967. So I showed her a video of that before we proceeded to talk about Rose Kennedy for the Kennedy's chapter, as an example. So I would show still photos uh, to kind of jog her memory because, I mean, we're talking 50, 60 years ago, some of the people we're talking about that she hadn't seen since then. So uh, any way I could think of jogging her memory, and we came up with a list beforehand, or I did, and she yayed or nayed the people on the list about whether or not she wanted to discuss them or not. She wanted it to be a book that was not Pollyanna, she would say, but she wanted it to be like a positive thing. She said, if I have something, and I'm quoting her directly here, if I have to say something unkind about someone, I want there to be a reason behind it, not just for the sake of saying something unkind. So although I think there is, you know, some juicy tidbits in the book, it's not salacious because that's not what we wanted. 
So you started writing the book in 2014. She became yes. ill in 2015 and died in 2016. Yes. And then her husband gave you permission to complete the book. Is that how it went? Yes, uh, we had done, thankfully, her part in the book was done before she passed away. So I didn't have to add or tweak anything of hers. It was just editing, editing, editing. Because when I was there, I stayed there, I don't know, it was 10 days or whatever I was at her home for. We worked hours and hours and hours each day working on the book, you know, recording chapters. And then I went home and wrote them. And then I would email her for suggestions or, you know, whatnot. And then we did some, anything I felt we didn't finish while I was in Idaho, we did recorded phone conversations on. So we were able to do that. And then, uh, then she became ill and we couldn't continue working on it. And um, I don't ever say specifically her illness or what was wrong because it's not my place. I'm not her family to say that, but I mean, she'd been ill for a time. She was ill when we were working on the book, even though we didn't know it was, would be ultimately fatal. We, she, she was, she persevered and we kept on with the book until she couldn't anymore but like i said at least she had finished her part in that so it was just me it was just a question of editing at that point so in a very yeah. real way this book is really her final words to her public yeah that's exactly what it is i think i even wrote that in there her last public appearances were before the book was completed so I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this but uh since the book she passed in 20 16 the book didn't come out to 2018 so i mean this was it i mean she hadn't done any interviews after we talked she did one acting job her final acting job on a sitcom uh guest appearance after we started to work on the book in the, in the middle of the book but other than that i mean this was it so there were no interviews nothing else and i think for fans of hers this is the ultimate show business story for her because, I mean, Call Me Anna basically focused on her life itself, which, of course, included show business and her mental illness. A Brilliant Madness, her second book, focused mostly on her mental illness. And this third book is, though there's pieces of the mental illness in there and how that affected her and maybe some of her work or her relationships with certain people, the book is a show business biography. Patty Duke was one of the most gifted child actors of all time, and she was one of the very few who successfully transitioned to being an adult star. What do you think made her able to do that when so many other child stars couldn't? I thought about that a lot, and I should have asked her. That would have been a great question to ask her. That's a good question to ask me. <laughs> Besides, you know, you just honestly want to go at talent, but, you know, a lot of those child stars are talented too. She just had it whatever it was, I think. And she, I think a lot of people identified with her. And since they saw her grow up, they were able to follow her from very young child to teenager to young adult and so forth. Maybe some identified with her. And I think that's because she was mostly a television actress, although we don't want to forget she was an Oscar winning film actress as well, but most of her work was in television. She once said to me, I'm just remembering this now, like she, I think it might even be in the book, that she felt that she was brought into people's homes every week or every time a movie of hers aired or whatnot, and people felt they could relate to her. And she said mostly fans felt comfortable approaching her. They would sing the Patty Duke Show theme song in an airport, she would always say, and I'd seen it happen. I was with her one time when we were in Denny's of all places, waiting for breakfast and somebody comes up to her, uh, we're sitting at the bench waiting to be seated and somebody comes up to her singing the Patty Duke Show theme. And, uh, you know, when she turned and smiled and, are you Patty Duke? Yeah, yeah, I'm Patty Duke, uh, you know, very good to meet you. And they hugged and she took pictures and signed uh, an autograph for her or whatnot. So, um, she was always the most gracious with her fans. Boy, did she get angry. It's hearing stories of celebrities who weren't gracious to their fans. When I read the book, I was just amazed by how many legendary stars she worked with. For example, I didn't know that Patty did a TV version of Meet Me in St. Louis in 1959 with Myrna Loy, Walter Pidgeon, Jane Powell, and Tab Hunter. And I had also forgotten that in 1979, she remade The Miracle Worker as a TV movie and played Annie Sullivan with Melissa Gilbert playing Helen Keller. Why do you think it was important for her to do that when the original director, Arthur Penn, was not happy about it? Yeah, I never did. I knew he wasn't happy about it. And there's a little bit about that in the book, in the Arthur Penn chapter. But that was always a dream of hers. And it wasn't really a sense when it came for the when the offer came to her in 79 to play the part of Annie Sullivan. 
that always been her dream. She used to, when she would be on Broadway as a, as a 12 year old girl uh, in the Miracle Worker as Helen Keller, she used to always recite Anne Bancroft's dialogue. Because as Helen Keller, she had one piece of dialogue, that's it. So she would recite it. And all those years later, 20 years later, she remembered every word. She, didn't, she said during a, a, a table reading, before they started rehearsal that uh, she was caught off page a lot of the times because she just knew the words and she wasn't on the correct page and the script, but she knew the words anyway. So that was a dream of hers, but she said she felt she needed Anne Bancroft's, not Arthur Penn's, but Anne Bancroft's permission, I guess spiritually, in order to, before she accepted uh, to sign on for the role. So she called Anne Bancroft and Anne Bancroft said to her, what are you afraid of? Being as good as me or being better? And uh, so she took the role. Patty had enormous love for Anne Bancroft, who co-starred with her on Broadway and in the movie The Miracle Worker. It was a true mother-daughter relationship, and she even delivered a eulogy at Anne Bancroft's funeral. That part of the book where Patty describes her friendship with Anne Bancroft is very touching. Yes. That was, by the way, the first little tidbit. Uh, that was the first chapter I sent to her. I emailed to her after I wrote. And she called me right away and she says, you know, you sound just like me, you know, you know, like with the ready. I said, well, it is you. And I know how you talk, you know, so if there was a word or two I had to add, you know, I knew what she would say or not. I think it was her personal favorite chapter in the book. It's one of mine, certainly. I mean, she just had, by the time we did this book and had been gone for about, I guess, 10 years, but still very alive inside Anna's heart, you know, to her dying day, she was Anne Bancroft's biggest fan. Yeah, both professionally and personally. There's a wonderful chapter in the book about what happened at the Oscars when Joan Crawford accepted the award for Anne Bancroft just to rub it in Betty Davis's face, <laughs> who had also been nominated for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. I yeah. love the way Patty put it when she said that although Betty Davis's performance had been great, it was right that Anne Bancroft won. And she says, and I'm quoting her here, it's often the role that wins the award as much as the performance. That's a very insightful comment about the Oscars, isn't it? It is. Is That chapter also states that she was an Academy member, a voting member herself. But uh, yeah, she took the Oscars very seriously, although she was in a way ambivalent toward awards because she thought she felt she did some of her own best work and didn't get, win awards, but she didn't do it for the awards. Uh, there was also, I don't know if controversy might be too strong of a word, but a Angela Lansbury was expected to win, not Patty Duke that year, for the Manchurian candidate. So Patty Duke was a bit of a surprise winner. Probably a big reason was because she was only 16 years old. And this was Angela's, I don't know, fifth nomination or whatever it was. But she felt they got it right. But she did say that about the role. She's like, if anybody has any talent and they're given the right direction, as she had with Arthur Penn, uh, the role could definitely give you success. Yeah. Patty also wrote that Academy Awards are really all about money. She mm -hmm. said in the book, the Oscars is a contest that's not winnable. What do you think she meant by that? I think because now, not so much when she won, uh, you know, over 50, almost 60 years ago now, but now it's just, I mean, in order to be nominated even, much less win, there has to be all these campaigns done and all this money spent. And it's not just nominating somebody because they gave the best or one of the best performances of that particular year. It's a money machine now. And I find myself, and I, I never thought of it in relation to what Anna had said there, but the Oscars this year, not just because it was COVID and everything going on, I find myself caring about it less and less each year. And I used to be obsessed, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I disagree with some of the winners so often anymore that, uh, you know, I still watch and I'll probably watch until the end of time for me, but uh, I, I just don't have the love for it I used to. And maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. The chapter about Patty's meeting with Helen Keller is also incredibly moving. And Helen Keller left Patty a little jade perfume bottle in her will. It's a shame that Patty never got to meet Annie Sullivan, but it's clear that she considered the Helen Keller role the most important of her entire career, didn't she? Oh, yeah. I think there's a, a line that I like in the book that she says, without the miracle worker and Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller, she would have been a good journeyman actor. So she, she, she said she probably would have worked and maybe would have gotten some of the TV movies and whatnot she later got. But she said, she said, my obituary would read quite differently, I think were the words she said. Well, just in case anyone out there is wondering, Patty's second favorite film was Me, Natalie, 
Although mine was My Sweet Charlie. What's your favorite Patty Duke performance, Bill? Oh, wow. People ask me this and I never have. I, I'm, I'm never courageous enough to give them an exact answer. I have favorites, plural. Me, Natalie, both Miracle Workers, Valley of the Dolls, certainly, which she grew to appreciate later on. My Sweet Charlie, like I said. Then there's some TV movies and stuff that aren't as well known that I think should be that she gave really good work. Uh, she landed an Emmy nomination for Supporting Actress for the Women's Room in 1980 that is discussed in the in the book and just one of the most magnificent pieces I've ever seen. And and you had told me, Harvey, that I don't know if, if you got a chance to watch that long 10 hour miniseries yet, but Catman's and the Kings is certainly one of my favorite, which she won her second Emmy for. It was just brilliant television and beautifully photographed and just lavish and, you know, just one of those great old miniseries. <laughs> Yes, I absolutely love Captains and the Kings, and I'm glad she won the Emmy for it. Yeah, me too. Now, as you know, the Patty Duke show was immensely popular. I was very surprised to read that it took Patty a long time to finally be proud of her work on the Patty Duke show. That show was wonderful, and she was terrific in it. Why do you think it took her so long for her to realize that? I think there's a couple of facets to it, but I think part of it is because she was allowed to watch it, so she didn't see her work. The Rosses, who we mentioned before, the managers who she lived with at the, at the time of the majority of the Patty Duke show filming and before, wouldn't let her see her own work because they figured it would swell her head too much. She'd get too much of an ego. She didn't watch an episode until she was nearly 40 years old. She was engaged to her husband and she was at a hotel room by herself. He was out. And she said she felt she had to put the Do Not Disturb sign on the door, but she didn't want people knowing that she was watching the Patty Duke show. But she never got over the bad hair. Uh, she never uh, grew an appreciation for that. But uh, she says, we told lovely stories. And what was going on behind closed doors at her home at that time was so horrible with being sexually molested and, and different things by the, these managers. It was a haven for her. And these people, she loved every single one of them. And I'm glad I got to see her with all of them, you know, later when I, in, in the late nineties, when I went up on the uh, Canada, like I said, for the reunion movie, God, they loved each other. I mean, they really did. They really did feel like they were a family. I know there was also because she was 16 when the show started, 19 when it ended. She was married by the time it ended. She married at 18 to the assistant director of the show. She wanted to be more mature and play. She was playing too young, she thought, which is one of the reasons why she went almost immediately into Valley of the Dolls after the Patty Duke show wrapped because she wanted to change her wholesome child image. Now you've mentioned in 1999, she did a TV movie that was a reunion of the Patty Duke show. And she wrote in the book that she wasn't happy with it. Why? It always have a special place in my heart for obvious reasons. That's where I met her. And I have a lot of memories there in Montreal where it's shot. It wasn't very good. <laughs> so, people are going to be mad at me for saying that. But the script, the, the copy I have of the script, I have an earlier draft, I think was better than the final product. Also, there was a director who kind of washed his hands of it, and I won't go too much into detail of that, but she was not very happy with that and felt she needed to direct some scenes herself, which I don't think I've ever shared publicly before. It's not in the book. But I think she also says in the book that she wouldn't have traded that experience for anything. It was worth it, seeing those people again after so many years. Bill, I have to tell you that I absolutely loved the chapter about working with Judy Garland briefly on the set of Valley of the Dolls before Judy got fired. That was really poignant. Patty talks about Judy's large gay following. And Bill, I'm sure you're aware that Patty Duke herself yes. also had a big gay following. Yes. Why do you think gay men loved Patty Duke so much? I kind of said this earlier, but I'll, I'll rephrase this. I assisted her, and I was an associate producer, I think was my title, at a Castro in San Francisco, a Castro uh, theater event back in 2009, where they honored her in a screening of Valley of the Dolls, and Bruce Valanche interviewed her, and he said, I think I know why you were, you are so popular with gay people, they just got you. And she, he joked saying, you cracked up, the, this is his words, uh, you cracked up, then you wrote a book about cracking up, and then you played yourself in a TV movie about cracking up. And he said, gay people looked at it and said, this is my life. <laughs> uh, now that's kind of a comical approach to it. But one reason too, I think is because the compassion she always had toward everyone, gay, straight, whatever race you were, I think that came across in not only her work, but personal interviews, personal appearances, and if maybe people met her in person. She was a really early, she never gets the credit, and not to take anything away from Elizabeth Taylor and all the wonderful things she did, but she was an early AIDS activist. I mean, 
she was out and she was president of the Screen Actors Guild during much of the in the mid 80s when it was at its, AIDS was at its height. She attended rallies. She she did things. I mean, she attended an ACT UP meeting even. She was really at the forefront there and she had worked with gay people. I mean, so many of the people in show business, both in front and behind the camera, were gay. She lived her whole life around gay people. She didn't see anything wrong with it. In fact, it was the gay community that helped Patty revise and soften her views about Valley of the Dolls, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I remember the first, one of the first times I emailed her before I met her in person when I was 17 or so, I was afraid to approach Valley of the Dolls because uh, how she had written about it in Colmiana um, several years earlier. And she was okay by that point about it. And she still didn't think it was the best movie in the world, nor did she give the best performance in the world, to put it mildly in her words, but she loved the appreciation. She's like, it can't be all bad if I, if the gays have such love for me, largely because of my role in Valley of the Dolls. And she loved, like I mentioned, the Castor event, and we did some other events too, where she loved participating in that stuff. Oh my God. And she, there's actually video footage from the Castor event in particular, where she's welling up in tears because of the standing ovation she's getting from the packed full Castor theater, 1400 seats or whatever it is there. And she, oh my God, she loved it. She wanted to tour with it. We were never able to uh, make that happen. She just, uh, she loved being around her gaze, as she would say, you know, they did bring her to appreciate it. And she had fun with it. She learned to have fun with it, not take it so seriously. I should mention that she was the Grand Marshal of the Gay Pride Parade in Hollywood in 1986. You've mentioned her activism for AIDS. And yes. Patty played a lesbian in at least one TV movie and also on Glee, didn't she? Yeah, thank you for mentioning the parade. I meant to, that was in my head a minute ago to mention that. So in 1986, she was newly married to her husband, Mike Pierce, and she was asked to be the Grand Marshal of the West Hollywood Gay Pride Parade. And she had no qualms about that. She was glad to do it. And she started getting death threats. And they were worried about her children at the time. She was getting all sorts of threats. So she put a bulletproof vest under her uh, outfit and uh, rode in the parade. Her husband rode on there with her for maybe for the protection. He was a military guy and she didn't care. She let the death threats. She had the police with her children at the time at home and she didn't care. She didn't let that stop her, the death threats. And yeah, she did play, there was a, an, it was actually a TV movie. It was an indie film, a Canadian film filmed in Toronto. It was filmed in 80, but not released until 82. Uh, called By Design, where she played uh, half of a lesbian couple who wanted to have a baby. And it was kind of a black comedy, the way that was handled. And many years later, one of her last roles was playing a lesbian character on Glee, who was with Meredith Baxter. We have a chapter on By Design and on Glee in the book chapters. So yeah, and she wasn't uncomfortable doing that. I think in By Design, she might have been, but she a little bit to start with. But she said her co-star, Sarah Botsford, in By Design, made her feel pretty comfortable with things. And, and she also said years earlier, though, in 1965, during the Patty Duke show, she made a film called Billy, which, you know, the word gay or homosexuality was never uttered in that. But I mean, if you look at it, you know, even she said herself, you know, Billy very well could, the character Billy very well could have been gay. But you couldn't say that in 1965. She was quite the tomboy. Now, we've already mentioned that Patty Duke was a high profile mental health advocate, and she was one of the very first celebrities to speak about mental illness openly. Mm -hmm. After Call Me Anna came out in 1987, Patty played herself in the 1990 TV movie based on the book. She wrote that she regretted playing herself and that it felt like she was at her own funeral. I thought she did a great job. Why do you think she regretted doing it? I never knew until we sat down for the book that she regretted doing it. She had told me that are also covered in that particular chapter in our book, some other things that she would have changed, uh, casting and whatnot. I think it was just uncomfortable for her. I mean, I think writing the book was one thing, but to dramatize it, to reenact it actually in front of cameras, I think took a lot on her emotionally. It took a big toll on her. She had said she felt another actress could have done a better job at it. But I remember when she was on Oprah promoting it, Oprah said to her, I think the fact that you played yourself gave it a certain bit of credibility that maybe wouldn't have happened if another actress was playing you instead. And I kind of subscribe more to that theory. I kind of disagree with, I, I see where she was coming from, Anna, but I 
I don't agree with her with that. I think she did a great job at it. I wish they could have given her a longer portion of the movie because two other actresses played her at younger ages. I wish Anna's portion was a little more fleshed out. It was only about the half hour, the last half hour of the movie or so. But yeah, I thought she did a great job. I did too. And in the book, Patty's very honest about the impact of her undiagnosed mental illness on her behavior and reputation. She was really hurt by what Richard Burton wrote about her in his memoir. He said he was appalled by her acceptance speech at the 1970 Emmy Awards because he thought she was high on drugs. It was actually mental illness that had not as yet been diagnosed or treated. It must have upset her terribly that many show business colleagues misunderstood her behavior. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the thing back then was, like she said, in the early, late 60s, early 70s, especially the big drug culture at the time here in the States. So that's what a lot of people just expected. Oh, she's a drug, she's high, she's drunk, whatever. And though she did dabble in alcohol, as she explains, um, more than she'd wanted to a, a, around that time, it was largely, mostly her mental illness, which she didn't know about until the 1970 Emmys. She did, wasn't diagnosed until a dozen years later in 82, as we said. So I, she had no idea what was going on in her head. She just thought she was a bad person. There was something, she knew there was something wrong, not right. But when she finally got that diagnosis at the age of 35, um, that she wasn't a bad person, there was a reason for this and a treatment, uh, it, it literally changed her life. Well, given the fact that she was seriously mentally ill with no diagnosis or treatment until 1982, don't you find it amazing that she was able to remain disciplined to her craft of acting and work so consistently to deliver such great performances for so many years, despite being very mentally unstable and often quite manic? Absolutely. She even said herself that she wonders how, like, when she wasn't working, she could often not get out of bed. She said she wouldn't even, go, she'd be in bed for several days at a time, wouldn't even get up to use the bathroom even. But she somehow found the discipline when it was time to go to work, she'd go to work. And as many times in our book, you will see she was very adamant uh, stickler as to time and to be on the set, not only on time, but early and really not liking when other performers or people would be tardy. She was very, she didn't know how to explain it. And I don't know how to explain it, I, but it is amazing. Like you said, she, her second book, A Brilliant Menace that we've mentioned, the title of that she was hesitant about, she had told me, because she didn't want to like glorify the illness, a brilliant madness. She didn't want to glorify it, but there have been people in history that often, you know, that were manic depressive or had some kind of illness, mental illness, and they were brilliant. And, you know, they were able to work their, their creativity. And some people would refuse to take medication because they felt it would dim their creativity. She didn't subscribe to that theory, but she felt that after she was medicated and successfully treated with, uh, initially it was lithium, that she did still did some of her best work, she felt. But, you know, there is an argument there that a lot of cr brilliant creative people have had mental issues. One of the most fascinating chapters in the book is about Patty's relationship with Desi Arnaz Jr. He was only mm -hmm. 17 at the time, even though he told her he was 19 and she believed it and yeah. she was 23. It's no secret that Lucille Ball was not supportive of the relationship and the tabloids had a field day over it. Mm -hmm. Over the years, Patty said some unkind things about Lucy, but in this book, she takes it all back. That yeah. takes guts and it shows tremendous integrity, don't you think? Oh yeah. I never, in all the years, you know, every once in a while, because I'd be in different fan forums or whatever online, and people would always bring up the whole Desi Jr. Lucy thing and Sean, her son, Sean's paternity and all that stuff. And I always shied away from it. And I, in all the years, I swear, I never, all the stuff we talked about, I never asked her about Lucy, even though I'm a huge Lucy fan. I don't think there's anything. I have Lucy stuff elsewhere in my uh, bedroom that you're not seeing on, on the camera. But I never asked her about that because I figured it was too much of a sore subject. And it wasn't until we were working on the book and she got more emotional during that chapter than any other chapter in the book. She really did because she just loved Lucy so much. And I think she did feel bad about saying some, not necessarily unkind things about her, but less than complimentary things about her and uh, her treatment toward her in the past. But now I think there's a quote in the book that says, right now I only have love for that woman. 
And uh, she did say that a few years before Lucy passed, they were at some soiree or, you know, something they were uh, together. And there's not a word said, but one of them was going up the staircase. One was going down at the same time. And she said, Lucy put her hand over hers and looked at her. And she says, anything, any animosity, any of the crap that went on so, so long ago was gone. And she said she knew that Lucy really, she felt Lucy really loved her as well after that moment. Patty wrote that she was always looking for a father. Her own father died when she was 16. How do you think that that longing affected the choices that she made in her life? Well, I think part of it might have been since she married at 18 for her first husband, wasn't old enough to be her father, but she was 18. I think he was 32 at the time. So there was an age difference there. And then later with John Aston, who was, I think, 16 years older than her, and I mean, she'd said herself, it was, she was kind of looking for a father fi figure. But then in 1986, she married a military man, Mike Pierce, and they were really happy until the day she died. Yes, and he was eight, and he's eight years her junior, so she went the opposite route <laughs> by that time. I guess she tried it with the older guys and went for the younger guys, I guess. Yeah, she always referred to Mike as the love of her life. And there's a thing in the Anne Bancroft chapter saying that out of anyone in her whole life, uh, besides Anne Bancroft, her husband was it for her. She said, and I think I'm quoting her directly, I, I have passion for my children and grandchildren, but Mike was just her be all and end all. They spent all their time together. He gave up his military career to help manage her career and to be with her on movie location sets. And she said they spent 24 seven together on purpose. And when she would have to go away on location, and he couldn't be there with her. I know how much she missed him, but they were together. He followed her on movie sets or TV sets whenever possible. And they were great to watch. They even bicker all the time, you know, like an old time married couple, just funny stuff. But she just, she just was head over heels in love with that man. He was it for her and, and vice versa. Have you kept in touch with him since she died? Yes. How's he doing? I went to her memorial, which was a few weeks after she passed up in North Idaho. And uh, I talked to him somewhat then. And then a couple months later, I called him about permission to finish, to forge on with the book, which he graciously gave me. He's doing very well. I haven't seen him since the memorial, but I mean, we talk on Facebook a lot, texts fairly frequently. And, you know, he often comments on things I post on Facebook. He's doing very well. He's in a relationship now and he's happy. You know, Bill, on more than one occasion in the book, Patty talks about mismanaging her finances. This is a woman that worked a lot in her career. What happened to all the money she earned? That's a very good question and one that I've never been able to figure out. I never felt my place to ask Mike or, you know, any, anything like that, her husband. I could be wrong. It is my opinion that she gave so much to those she loved that sometimes she she probably paid for this one's schooling, for that one's, you know, dentist, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And that might have something to do with that. I don't know. She did not live extravagantly. She was not someone who had chauffeurs and diamonds and furs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So she lived pretty simply. Hate, yeah. She, and she was very low maintenance. She really, at least when I knew her, maybe when she was younger, she wasn't, but uh, she was very low maintenance. She once told me when she was here at my home 10 years ago, we were having, I remember we were cleaning up after dinner, which she insisted on helping us clean up. <laughs> and she had said something, I don't remember the context of the conversation, but, but she had said something about how she always felt like she had to, if she saw something she wanted, a material possession, she needed to get it. She needed to buy it. And now she's like, now I'm really realizing I really don't. She's like, if I just let it pass, it will, it'll be okay if I don't own this or that. Yeah. That's as best as I can answer that question. I thought it was interesting that Patty's favorite leading man was Richard Crenna, even though she was a left-wing Democrat and he was a right-wing Republican. And it yeah. made me realize there used to be a time when people could still be good friends, despite being at the opposite ends of the political spectrum. I miss those days, Bill, don't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, she passed before the 2016 election here in the States, so she didn't see the outcome of that. I know she would not have been happy. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And she was a huge Hillary supporter. There is actually uh, a chapter I deleted from the book about Hillary Clinton because by the time the book came out, it was after the election. And I just felt it was too uh, sensitive to put in there anymore. I think it would hurt her too much because of the outcome. That's why. Um, not because of anybody's political affiliations, but because I think she would have wanted it deleted from there. Her and Krenna were wonderful friends. We were in a diner one time 
And I remember she said to me, he was, me and Richard Crenna, like he was part of the NRA. And she used some four letter words, some four letter expletives to say what she thought of the NRA, but she still loved him. They found, you know, common ground, I guess. They both knew each other's political affiliations and they found common ground with that. I want to ask you, Patty wrote in the book that she believed in angels. Since she passed, have you felt her presence guiding and watching over you, Bill? Yes. I've never talked about it, I don't think, before publicly, but there were little, especially after she, soon after she passed, there were little signs. Whenever I would kind of say a silent prayer to her or whatever, I get a chill through my body, which I learned, I've heard that that is a sign that they're with you. I would see signs of different things, like I would see the word Anna on a wall somewhere or something like that, and just, I'm trying to think of something more specific, and that doesn't scare me, that comforts me. As you know, my own mom passed a couple of weeks ago, and I have I was telling someone just two days ago over lunch, one of the signs that I believe my mother has left for me, and they're like, oh, they were freaked out. I'm like, it doesn't freak me out. It's comforting to me to know that there's something, whatever it is, I don't know if there's a heaven or whatever it is, I think there's something else, not on this earth that we can't see under a microscope. You know, and I think there is something else. And I have, this is something I never planned to share publicly, but what the heck. With Anna, a medium once said to me, who didn't know me from anything, said, oh my God, like Patty Duke is coming forward, you know, to you. And and they, I'm like, really? So, I mean, there's been a lot of things. And her first thing was, what the hell took you so long to contact me? (laughs) Was what he said, she said. And a lot of things were, you know, people, some people might think I'm nuts for, you know, believing this stuff. But what he said, a lot of the stuff he said was right on the money stuff that nobody else would know about. So I do believe there is something else. That's how I could get, th- whether it's real or not, it's how I get through stuff. Not only do I think that she is there guiding and protecting you, but I think she would be very, very happy with this book. And I want to mention to all of our viewers, the website for the book is pattydukebook.com. On that website, you can buy a copy of the book signed by Bill. And if you do that, you'll also get exclusive bonus chapters deleted from the final manuscript. Bill has also graciously offered a 15% discount for our viewers if you order the book on the website pattydukebook.com. The discount code is Harvey Brownstone, all one word. That should be easy to remember. I was about to say, it should be easy for you guys to remember. (laughs) Also, the audio version of the book narrated by actress Kathy Garver and by Bill is available for download and as a CD. So if you're a Patty Duke fan, and who isn't, you will really, really love this book. Thank you. Yeah, the audio book was something I wrestled with because she and I, she didn't do audio books for her first two books. And she said to me, I don't know why, I just, I turned them down when it was offered. And she said, but for this book, I want to do an audio book. I remember her saying that. And then obviously she passed and that was it. And then people would ask me and I'm like, she's gone. I don't want anybody else reading it. Like, I'm sorry. But my publisher I'd offered to do an audio book and was letting me make the decision. And so I was wrestling with the decision and somebody came to me and asked if there was an audio book version of the book because of their sight impaired friend couldn't read the book and he said if 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 there is no audiobook I'll be happy to read it to him but he just loved her and I know he would love your book so much and I took that as a sign as that okay Anna you don't have to be more clear than that like all right let's do the audiobook between that and also with Anna's history with Helen Keller and people with physical disabilities I think yeah an audiobook was the right decision and the fact that Kathy Garver who did a wonderful job narrating it. A lot of people tell me it even they even forget it's Kathy and they think it's Anna reading it. That's how good she is. And the fact that Kathy knew Anna and worked with her and was good friends with her really helped sweeten the pot for me as well. So yeah, three months ago, it was available to download on Audible. Well, this just was released this week. So this is the audio book on CD for, because a lot of people wanted the physical copy. So it's on nine CDs and... So if, that, if you prefer that over a download to have something to put, some people said, I want to put it on my shelf in my Patty Duke collection or whatnot. So now you can, as of three days ago, it's been available in, in CD format as well. Did you get a chance to say goodbye to her, Bill? <sighs> no. The last thing I ever said to her, well, we had spoken on the phone, but it was, Mike was good. Her husband, Mike, was good at texting and calling with updates about her health and things like that. 
the last thing she ever said to me was in a text. And this, uh, my mom, like she just, like I said, she passed. She had Louie body dementia. And it was, a, it was a 10 year grueling, terrible, awful ordeal. And one time my mother came up to me and she said, she tapped me on the shoulder. This was about a month before Anna passed. Uh, so early 2016, she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, who was your mother? She said to me, my own mom. And uh, that got me. And I felt the need to text Anna about that. And she replied saying, that's your mother. And don't let her, you know, like she, she, that is your mother. And don't you ever forget that. And you remind her as much as it hurts that she's your mother and you're her son. And that was the last thing she had ever in a text, but that was the last thing that she'd ever said to me. And when she passed, I knew it was coming. I knew before, you know, the, the public. And Mike was gracious enough to call me. And it was like 5.30 in the morning, Eastern time here. They were in Pacific time. And I said, please tell her. I didn't know. Well, he told me that she passed, but I didn't know until a few minutes into the conversation that he was still with her. It was about an hour and a half after she passed and he was still in the hospital room with her, sitting next to her while on the phone with me. And, you know, that was wow. And uh, I said, please tell her that I love her. And he, he said, sweetheart, Bill says he loves you, you know, and that was my goodbye. Yeah. And I think this book is a gift to her. And to her legacy and, and her legacy, memory. Exactly. And it's a gift to her fans. Exactly. And I don't like to pat myself on the back with that, but yeah, I did, I did write by her. I feel there was some animosity toward a few people at the end thinking that, uh, well, not the end, but when the book came out thinking it shouldn't have been done and things like that. But I know I did write by her and I will go to my own grave knowing I did write by her and her final words deserve to be read by her public. And I think she would appreciate that. And I, and I think, well, through the medium anyway, uh, she told me that she's very proud of the book and uh, whether that he's correct or not, like, I, I believe that in my heart that uh, she is proud of the book, wherever she is. I do too, Bill. Uh, Bill, yeah. it's been a, a tremendous pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thank it's, you so it, much, Harvey. It's meant a lot to me to have you on the show. I'm a huge Patty Duke fan and through mm -hmm. you and your wonderful book, I feel like I got to know her really well. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for taking the time to appear on our show. I wanted to thank you too, Harvey, for you have been so wonderful. We've never met, obviously, but ever in the last month or so, since we've been in the process of figuring out a, a scheduling and everything, you know, I was honest about with my mom's situation and she was in hospice and everything. I don't know, like I just said, I don't know you, Harvey, but I want your viewers to know what a kind, wonderful man you are. This man kept checking up on me. Uh, to see how I was doing, to see how my mom was doing, and after she passed, to see how it meant a lot. So thank you. Well, you're very, very welcome. And I do hope I'll get the pleasure to meet you in person one of these oh, days. Oh, we will. We will. I, I can't wait to come up to Canada. We'll, we'll definitely have a good time. <laughs> and Patty will be there with us. I just know it. Absolutely. She will be. She will. <laughs> Thank Our you. guest has been William Jankowski, co-author of Patty Duke's final book, In the Presence of Greatness. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.